Supply Side Policies and Economic Growth by Camilla Chadda. In this video, there are five things I would like to explore. First, what is the economic growth? Then, what are supply side policies? What are the different types of supply side policies? How can they be used to improve economic growth? And what are the, some of the problems that are associated with the policies and the aggregate demand and aggregate supply diagram involved? Economic growth. So what is economic growth? Economic growth is changes in GDP. GDP, gross domestic product, is a total value of goods and services produced in an economy. So essentially growth is the increase in production of goods and services in an economy. Most economists say 2% is a stable rate for a mature economy like the UK is to grow at. Because if they grow too much, let's say 4 or 5%, then the, there is a chance the economy will overheat. And obviously, if it's negative, then we're going into a recession, doom and gloom. So what are supply-side policies? Well, the basic fact is that in economics, we see that we only have a fixed amount of resources. So what supply-side policies do is they ensure that we can produce more out of the same amount of resources. So they're policies which are designed to manipulate the long run aggregate supply. So let's remind ourselves aggregate supply is the total supply of goods and services in an economy. How do we do that? By increasing productivity of the factors of production, which are land, labor, capital and enterprise. So in this video, we're going to be exploring eight different types of supply side policies. Five are traditional supply side policies. This means that the government role in an economy is reduced by implementing these policies. And three are interventionist types, which means that actually the government role is increased by implementing these policies. So the first policy is reducing taxes. Now, what basically happens is if you reduce income tax and people will work more enthusiastically because they're getting more money, they're more motivated, so they're likely to produce more. And if you cut corporation tax, this gives firms more money, more profit to reinvest into the business to increase productivity or reinvest the money into um, training of the staff or capital equipment, improving it. So like this, you are going to get more out of the fixed amount of resources that you have now the the problem is is that firms might not reinvest the money back into the business they may just take it for themselves and enjoy it shareholders might do that and also we can use the laffer curve analysis to show that if taxes are kept too low the government is not getting the optimal amount optimum amount of revenue and revenue is obviously important because as we'll see we need this revenue to implement other supply side policies such as education and training Number two, reducing unemployment benefit. Now, what this does is that if there are no unemployment benefits, more people are likely to be motivated to work. There's an incentive to work. And not only will people be more willing to work, they will be more willing to work at a lower rate because it's better than nothing, the pay they're getting. So this increases um, productivity because firms can employ more people because they can charge a lower rate and more people are willing to work so that means there's more supply uh, floating around to improve productivity now the problem is being the problem being is that if you do this then the poor are made poorer because if they don't have work then they're made worse off and this can have adverse effects on their inequality on their income distribution Number three is reducing national minimum wage and employment legisl legislation. I put them two together because I think they're very similar. If you reduce national minimum wage, that means that firms can um, pay people a lower wage and that means they can employ more people and what we can see from the diagram is is because of national minimum wage the labor supply out of what runs the labor demand so that means there's unemployment but if you get rid of the national minimum wage then labor supply meets the labor demand and this means that more people are employed and it also means productivity um, can increase Again, if you reduce employment legislation, you make hiring and firing workers much more easier. So this leads to a more flexible and productive labor market. 
However, the problem is again being that if you get rid of something like national minimum wage, this can have adverse imp impacts on income distribution. And it's not a very realistic thing. I don't think governments can realistically reduce the national minimum wage once it has been implemented. Another thing is if workers are constantly worrying about their job going, they're living in uh, fear, they're going to be stressed. And if they're stressed, then productivity is likely to fall. Number four is reducing trade union power. So basically, if trade unions interrupt less into a firm and its uh, workings, then more things, uh, more productivity um, can exist. And also, if workers are less likely to go on strike or demand higher perks or higher wages or everything because they lack support, then firms can run more efficiently and more consistently. But the problem with this is, is that it's not very realistic. I don't think a government can say, okay, I'm going to reduce the power that trade unions have because it's an unpopular decision. And another thing, just like with reducing national minimum wage and employment legislation, is that if workers are constantly stressed and their well-being is not there, then they are likely to not work very hard and productivity is likely to fall. So the fifth Fifth policy is privatization and deregulation. Now, what this does, if you privatize a, a, a firm, then they're forced to be more efficient because of free market economics. There's more competition around. They have to be with consumers. They they just have to be more efficient. And if they do that, then output increases. And also, if there is competition and it does exist, then this makes it better for consumers. And deregulation again, it gives firms the, their own sort of decision making and everything in their own hands so they can be more efficient the problem is is like with deregulation the banks would um they had been deregulated and we didn't know some of the implications that's one of the reasons which caused the credit crunch so some of the implications we don't know of and they might be pretty big and another thing is shareholders um of these firms because if they if you privatize the wrong kind of industry something which is like a consumer re, a consumer's need such as electricity if you privatize that then firms can make a lot of money cuz demand is inelastic and shareholders might just keep this money to themselves fat cat owners basically and as you can see in the picture um the healthcare cuz it's an inelastic demand they're likely to keep the money for themselves so this is the problem we're implementing such policies previous five policies were all traditional policies because they all reduced the role of the government the following three we're going to look at all traditional um sorry they're all interventionist um supply side policies so this one number six is education and training so what this basically does is if the government spends more money than um, on education and training then people become more skilled and more specialized therefore they can produce more so you have more productivity which improves aggregate supply now the problem with the three types of um, interventionist policies are because they all involve increasing government spending they can have inflationary pressures as we can see as we see from an increase in anchor demand but in terms of just education, some of the other problems are it's expensive, there's a large opportunity cost, and not only that, it takes a long time to see the benefits of it, the time, time lags involved, and this means that if a government's only in power for five years, they wouldn't want to spend on education, because you can't see the effects of it by the time it's the next election, you'll see it 10, 20 years down the line, so it takes too long, this policy. The second intervention in supply side policy is spending on infrastructure improvements. So if the government spends on wiring, water, transport, things like that, then firms don't have to pay very much in making these um, basic infrastructure things happen and happen at a good sort of level for them. So this reduces the cost of production that gives them, again, more money to reinvest into uh, research and development etc etc but it also allows us to get more out of the resource of enterprise without actually increasing enterprise and again here the problems are is that it's quite expensive some of the policies will take ages like there'll be loads of time lags involved and again the opportunity cost is there and there are inflationary pressures 
The last one is subsidies and tax incentives. This is different to reducing tax because when you reduce tax, the government role is decreasing because the government revenue is decreasing, so government spending is decreasing. When you're actually um, providing tax incentives and subsidies, government spending is actually increasing. And it works because it allows firms, again, to have more money to invest in research, development, training, capital improvements, etc., etc., so they can produce more firms counts, so increasing aggregate supply. Uh, again, you have the problem of inflation pressures, it's expensive, there are time lags again involved with subsidies because it takes a long time to, particularly in agriculture and things like that, to see the improvements and there's an opportunity cost. But here, the problem is, is that if inefficient firms are given money and are allowed to be inefficient, essentially, then there can be a misallocation of resources. So now it's important to see how do supply side policies actually improve economic growth. Now from the diagram you can see that these policies increase productivity in an economy and so they push long run aggregate supply outwards from LRAS1 to LRAS2. As a result there has been um, a decrease in aggregate demand and this uh, pushes price down and economic growth increases because it increases from Y1 to Y2 So that's how economic growth actually increases and remember economic growth is the total uh, Productivity of goods and services. What do supply side policies do increase this? Thank you for watching. Please visit my blog